Today's integrated world is a step forward in the progress of humanity. For much of history, East and West had no direct contact. In the 13th century, the Mongols conquered China and established an unprecedented empire that changed the political landscape of Eurasia and eroded the barriers between East and West. It was the travel memoir of an Italian, Marco Polo, that revealed the magical Eastern civilization to the West, which was still relatively backward in the late Middle Ages. But great changes were brewing in the world. A new era of human history was in the making. The Mongols established their empire by a revolution in military organization. But Kublai Khan built his Yuan dynasty in China on existing Han Chinese methods of administration. By the end of the 13th century, Kublai's China was politically stable, militarily strong, commercially prosperous, and scientifically developed. It was the world's most developed country. The Inner Mongolia Museum has a large collection of precious artifacts from the Yuan dynasty. Before the Mongol conquest, Chinese had already produced silk, porcelain, the compass, and gunpowder. During the Yuan dynasty, they invented the world's first gun, the oldest surviving metal-barreled hand cannon, or Huo Chong, was unearthed in Heilongjiang province. Huo Chong is a Yuan invention. This is absolutely true. Whether who invented it, there is no clear information in history. We generally think that it was based on the Song Ren's hand cannon on the Song Ren's hand cannon. The Heilongjiang hand cannon was the first firearm that could be used to kill multiple enemies at long range. It could be loaded with up to a hundred pieces of lead shot. Many Chinese inventions and advanced technologies were introduced to the West through the Mongol conquests. Marco Polo described many other innovations that made China the most powerful nation of his time. Meanwhile, in Europe, northern Italy was the center of Western civilization. Although Italy was not a unified country, cities such as Pisa, Florence, Venice, and Genoa were wealthy and prosperous. Their trade routes crisscrossed the Mediterranean. They had their own governments and armies and constituted independent states. Alberto Tosofai, a writer and historian, is an expert on the history of Venice and Marco Polo. A quel tempo nessuno nell'emisfero occidentale sapeva molto della Cina e della sua civiltà, a eccezione di un uomo, Marco Polo, un veneziano che fu tenuto prigioniero in un carcere genovese. La rivalità tra Venezia e Genova era cresciuta al punto che nel 1298 i genovesi attaccarono le navi della Serenissima. La battaglia si risolse in una completa vittoria genovese e i veneziani furono fatti prigionieri e tenuti in ostaggio. In carcere i suoi compagni di prigionia gli chiesero di raccontare dei suoi viaggi. The emperor would seem to have the power of alchemy, for he makes his money in this way. He has workers extract the sapwood from the bark of mulberry trees and grind it in stone mortars until it turns into pulp. The pulp is used to make paper cut into sheets of different sizes. These sheets of paper are given a vermilion seal by the Khan's chief officer and turned into official money. I make the 
Oh, don't worry. My family will use gold to purchase my release. Although the other prisoners laughed, the paper money Marco Polo described did exist. The Chinese had invented a system in which paper money could be exchanged for silver or used to pay for goods of the equivalent value. China is the most important country in the world. The most important country in the world is the most important country in the world. It has been around 1,000 years. After the Yuan Chao, in 1260, it began to be the most important country in the world. 也就是中统元宝交钞，简称中统钞。这种纸币是以桑皮纸制成，面额分十等，以白银为本。当时规定，每白银一两可以兑换二贯文省的中统钞。南宋灭亡后，这种纸币开始推向全国。Paper notes were first viewed as a debt contract. Under which the borrower promised to pay back the amount of gold or silver recorded on the note. Later, they became a form of credit, under which the government undertook to reimburse the holder with an amount equal to the value printed on the note. In Marco Polo's time, the main Italian currency was a gold coin issued in Florence and called the florin. With many Florentine banks opening branches across Europe, the florin became the dominant trading coin of Western Europe. The first European country to issue paper money was Sweden in 1661, fully 600 years after China. There is a kind of black stone existing in beds in the mountains throughout the country that they dig out and burn like firewood. If you light them at night, you will find them still alight in the morning. They make such excellent fuel that although there is no lack of wood, the stones burn better and cost less. In China, people bathe at least once a week. Every wealthy or noble family has a private bathroom. As a result, they have a great demand for wood as fuel for heating water to bathe in. All their wood would not suffice, but luckily they have rich reserves of the black stones. <laughs> L'uomo che credette a Marco Polo si chiamava Rustichello e veniva dalla città di Pisa. Se non fosse stato per lui, noi oggi non sapremo nulla di Marco Polo e dei suoi viaggi. Rustichello da Pisa fu segregato nello stesso carcere, eh, credette alle parole di Marco Polo e affermò solennemente che eh, avrebbe trascritto l'esperienza di viaggio del veneziano per trasmetterla alle generazioni successive. As Marco Polo's fellow prisoners listened, they embarked on a fabulous journey around China. Marco's story was written down by Rusticello da Pisa. The result was The Travels of Marco Polo, a work that was received at first as a form of entertainment. All'inizio probabilmente la gente comune non sapeva molto del libro di Marco Polo, uh, ma all'epoca la gente comune non sapeva molto di libri in generale. Eh, lo stesso Marco Polo, che diventavano un patrimonio soprattutto orale, cioè venivano raccontate a voce e facevano parte anche dei, uh, diciamo, Della, della scelta che gli affabulatori nelle feste di, di paese piuttosto che nelle fiere eh, raccontavano alla gente comune naturalmente aggiungendo, esagerando, eh, togliendo, arricchendo e creando quel tipo di eh, testo in parte fantasioso certamente originario dal, eh, lontano dal regionale, che fece poi dire alla gente che questo era il libro cosiddetto del milione, questo titolo del milione da, eh, non, va, non è un numero il milione, dall'idea di una esagerazione. 
Marco Polo was born to a wealthy merchant in Venice in 1254. During his childhood, he saw very little of his parents. When he was six, his father, Niccolo Polo, and his uncle, Maffeo, decided to leave Venice to explore Asian markets. After his mother died, Marco was raised by an uncle and aunt and was expected to become a merchant like his father. When he was 15, his father returned home with a great fortune and countless astounding tales of his travels. The young Marco was deeply impressed and longed to travel in his father's footsteps, no matter how difficult or dangerous the journey might prove. Fired by his father's descriptions of the wealth and magnificence of the great Khan's empire, he longed most of all to go to China. In 1271, Niccolo Polo and Maffeo decided to travel once again to Asia. This time, Marco Polo went with them. Marco was 17 and could already speak four languages. He was ready to join his family business. The onslaught of the Mongols in the 13th century had shocked the world. After the rise of Genghis Khan in Mongolia, they expanded their rule over other countries, building an empire larger than any empire before it. Many peoples in the vast expanse from the Pacific in the east to the River Danube in the west became subjects of the Mongols. In 1260, Kublai Khan succeeded to the throne and became the fifth great Khan of the Mongol Empire. In 1271, he became the first Yuan Emperor of China. He was a brilliant general, but also an inspired ruler. Many Mongol rulers had shown terrifying cruelty to the conquered peoples. But early in his reign, Kublai adopted the Chinese political and cultural model. He allowed the vanquished populations freedom of religion, which helped develop a good relationship with his subjects. The earliest copies of the travels of Marco Polo were handwritten. At that time, there were no printers in the West. The National Library of St. Mark in Venice has a handwritten copy of the book. Its title is The Marvels of the World Through the Eyes of Marco Polo. It is a French version, translated and richly illustrated for a king of France. Before Marco Polo left for China with his father and uncle, they visited the Pope. Kublai Khan had requested that the Polos bring a hundred missionaries to China. Given the Mongols' reputation for cruelty, the Pope was unwilling to put so many lives at risk. He gave the travelers a letter for Kublai and dispatched just two friars to go with them. According to the travels, the Venetians found Armenia reeling from defeat by the Muslim Mamluks. Two friars were so afraid, they decided to turn back. The Polos, however, were not deterred. They continued their journey. They traveled through Persia, crossed the Pamir Mountains, and entered present-day southern Xinjiang. After traveling through Kashgar, the Arkand Khanate, and Khotan, they ventured into the fearsome Lop Desert. The desert crossing was their greatest challenge. The temperature would soar during the day and plunge to freezing at night. Like other travelers before them, they suffered terrifying delusions in the driving sandstorms, imagining a world full of ghosts. Some travelers had hallucinations so intense they were driven to suicide. It was also said 
that if a traveler happened to lag behind at night, when he tried to catch up to his companions, he would hear spirits calling him by name, leading him astray to his death. Sometimes travelers saw visions of heavily armed and ghostly troops marching towards them, making them flee for their lives into the desert, where they would starve to death. In 1275, after three years on the road, the Polos finally arrived in Shangdu, the fabled Xanadu. Shangdu in Inner Mongolia was the first capital of the UN dynasty. In 2012, the site was inscribed on the World Heritage List for its unique urban design. This是玉天门 然后经过皇城In Shangdu, there is a very fine marble palace. All its halls and rooms are gilt and painted with figures of birds, animals, flowers and plants, executed with exquisite art. There is a wall around the palace, and inside the park are fountains, rivers and brooks, meadows and wild animals, though none is ferocious. Kublai Khan received the Polos in his magnificent palace. They managed to gain the emperor's trust, which won them the respect of his court officials. Later, Kublai sent Marco on missions throughout the empire and even appointed him to an official position. The first place Marco visited was Kanbalik, present-day Beijing. Today, we can trace structures dating from the time of Kublai Khan on satellite images of the Forbidden City. In 1272, a year after he became emperor of China, Kublai made Kanbalik a capital city and renamed it Dadu. Dadu and Shangdu became the twin capitals of the Yuan dynasty. In Dadu, Marco Polo saw many things that astounded him. As a merchant, he was attracted to the huge variety of goods as well as the city's urban design. All the houses are square in shape and well aligned with each other. The whole city is like a chessboard. No words can describe its grandeur. In fondo Marco Polo rappresenta eh, un grande pioniere, eh, scopritore non soltanto di paesaggi e di esperienze nuove per lui e per il popolo che rappresentava a quell'epoca ma anche scopritore di un mondo di filosofie, di pensieri, di civiltà. E quindi un italiano che torna in Cina in qualche modo si sente a modo suo un piccolo Marco Polo. There is no other place like Kanbalik. But as in India, there are many precious stones and pearls and a variety of medicines and spices. It boasts the greatest amount of merchandise in the world. Every day, thousands of carts arrive, loaded with silk, gold vessels, handcrafted items, and other goods. Recent research shows that Marco Polo is 
。作为大汉忽必烈身边的沃托，马可波罗会经常出使各地，为大汉赚取经济利益，同时也担负大汉的一些特殊使命。Leaving Dadu, Marco Polo traveled south. He was impressed by the Lugo Bridge over the Yongding River and gave a detailed description of it. The bridge is 300 paces long and eight paces wide. It would not feel crowded if 10 horses walked abreast along it. It has 24 arches and is supported by 25 piers. Altogether, it is a most beautiful object. There are also pillars carved with beautifully executed stone lions, and the space between them is closed with slabs of grey marble to prevent people from falling into the water. Because he's a merchant, he's also a merchant who lived in Venice. Venice is a river, it's a lot of water. He's very concerned about the river. The river is a very detailed description of the river. In other cities, he often writes that this city has how many rivers. It's also that the numbers are too much. It's a bit exaggerated, he may have written it wrong. How did Marco Polo get this information? Marco Polo doesn't know Chinese, this is really true. But from his notes, Marco Polo should have been born in the Mongolian, Bosnian, Turkish, and Arab languages. You know, in the time of the Mongolian society, Chinese is not a common language. Many Mongolian people and Sermon people came to China to visit, they often have to translate this language to the Chinese people and to the Chinese people. So this is not a problem for Marco Polo. His next stop was Hangzhou, with the Grand Canal serving as his shortcut to South China. He became the first foreigner to travel the entire length of the canal. After the fall of the Southern Song Dynasty, the Yuan Dynasty rebuilt the Jizhou and Huitong canals. In 1291, it opened the Tunghui Canal, so creating an uninterrupted connection between the capital and Hangzhou. He described the Grand Canal as being wide and deep as a river, and serviceable for its entire length, allowing boats loaded with goods to travel all the way from Guazhou to Kanbalik. Marco Polo traveled the Grand Canal many times and visited many southern Chinese cities on its banks. He was always impressed by their prosperity and beauty. Hangzhou, however, amazed him. He called it the heavenly city, the loveliest and most splendid in the world. As a Venetian, he was especially impressed by the city's lake setting. Inside the city is a lake with a compass of some 30 miles. Around the lake are beautiful palaces and pavilions, rich and exquisite. The city boasts 10 squares or marketplaces that receive around 40 to 50,000 visitors per day. In front of the squares, there is a pedestrian street which is 40 paces in width and runs straight from one end of the city to the other. The pedestrian street mentioned by Marco Polo was the Southern Song Dynasty's Imperial Street. In March 2008, the Hangzhou Institute of Archaeology carried out excavations to try to find the old Imperial Street. After 20 days, the dig discovered its remains 2.2 meters beneath the surface, near number 112 Zhongshan Middle Street. 当年马可波罗来的时候，他所看到的这段玉阶，当时他真是大阶，很有可能就是我们现在发现的这个石板，主要有石板砌筑的这部分玉阶遗迹。呃，通过我们的发掘工作呢，我们发现这段玉阶
，它是由这个石板砌做的。那么两侧的这个包边，哎，它是由石头和这个砖块混合砌做的这么一部分，所以这一点呢是相同的。The archaeologists found an intact stone slab. It was a flagstone, just as Marco Polo had described. And there was more evidence. The entire excavation site, its width is about 10 meters. The two sides are covered with stone. This is also consistent with what Marco Polo saw. Because the Jiangnan Dynasty has more rain, the Jiangnan Dynasty has more rain. The Jiangnan Dynasty has more rain. The Jiangnan Dynasty has more rain. The Jiangnan 那么它的两侧呢，正好有排水沟，呃，两侧的排水沟呢，这个水呢，最终是汇入到中河里去的。这个呢，和当年马可波罗看到的也是一致的。Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years. In that time, he traveled throughout the Yuan Empire, from Mongolia in the north to Burma in the south, and Tibet in the west. His memoir of his travels introduced Europeans to the geography, peoples, and resources of Asia. Europeans were already familiar with many products from Asia, but Marco Polo was the first to give a detailed description of their place of origin and its culture. After so many years in China, Marco Polo became increasingly homesick. Kublai Khan repeatedly turned down his requests to return home. He had to wait. In 1291, an opportunity arose. Agun Khan, Kublai Khan's great nephew and ruler of the Ilkhanate in Persia, requested a new bride from Kublai after the death of his consort, Mulu Khan Khatun. He wished for a bride from the same family. Kublai Khan chose Kirkachin, then needed an envoy to escort her to Persia. The Polos saw their opportunity. They suggested to the emperor that as experienced travelers, they would be the ideal escorts for the princess's long journey. This time, Kublai Khan granted their request. The three Venetians, the princess and their entourage, set sail from the port of Chuenzhou, which Marco Polo called Zeton in his memoir. He also mentioned one show pagoda, a beacon tower in the city. In 1293, the Polos reached the port of Hormuz in the Ilkhanate, and by 1295, they were back in Venice. They had been away for over 20 years. Marco Polo was now aged 41. News of their arrival spread quickly. After only two days, and now in luxurious garb, the Polos presented themselves to their friends and relatives at a banquet in their home. There they tore their worn-out Mongol clothing into pieces. To the company's amazement, jade, rubies, garnets and diamonds fell from the rags onto the table. La storia del ritorno a Venezia di Marco Polo ci arriva dal suo primo vero biografo, Giovanni Battista Ramusio, che nel Cinquecento, nel suo libro Delle navigazioni e viaggi, ne parla come di una vicenda narrata nella sua famiglia da molte generazioni. Ramusio racconta inoltre della prigionia genovese di Marco Polo, spiegando come egli fosse molto rispettato e riverito e non trattato come un prigioniero di guerra. Nel maggio del 1299 Venezia e Genova siglano un accordo di pace. Marco e Rustichello possono fare ritorno a casa. Alcuni mesi più tardi le prime copie del libro potevano già essere trovate in giro per l'Italia e presto il milione fu tradotto anche in altre lingue europee. Home in Venice once again, the well-traveled Marco enjoyed great celebrity and so did his stories. Many of his compatriots clamored to hear them. Others, however, were skeptical about the truth of his tales. Some accused him of being an outright liar. Yet no one could disprove Marco Polo's stories. China was too far away, and the journey there was too dangerous. 
The centuries have rolled on, and today people can easily travel to China and see it with their own eyes. Italy and Venice, Marco Polo's home, are also popular destinations for many Chinese. It is now possible to judge for yourself what is true and what is false in Marco Polo's description of China. After his death in 1324, Marco Polo's reputation declined even more. His name became synonymous with boastfulness. Giovanni Battista Ramuzio, the author of the first biography of Marco Polo, wrote, during the Carnival of Venice, there is a clan who calls himself Marco Polo of the Millions and is an incurable boaster. By the 15th century, thanks to the printing press, the travels of Marco Polo became very popular, but the author's reputation did not improve. His memoir was even renamed The Million. Europeans still retained a vivid memory of Genghis Khan and his savage horsemen, who had conquered most of Eurasia. Few were convinced that the descendants of Genghis Khan were capable of establishing great civilizations or creating trading cities even busier than Venice. Chinese 发展的经济和文化，另一个文明的天地。In In his old age, Marco Polo constantly recalled his experiences in China. From time to time, he would don Mongolian costume and recount his time in Kublai Khan's palace or in the bustling streets of Hangzhou. Marco Polo married once and had three daughters. His will is the only document that actually proves his existence. It is now in the National Library of St. Mark. Sentendosi mancare le forze di giorno in giorno, Marco Polo fa redigere il suo testamento il 9 gennaio 1323 e ne certifica la validità con il tocco della mano. Eh, è questo oggi l'unico documento originale rimastoci ad attestare la vita del veneziano. Eh, con esso stabilisce che ad ereditare i suoi beni siano la moglie donata e le tre figlie. Un ricordo dei suoi viaggi emerge dalla menzione di uno schiavo tartaro, Pietro, eh, che il veneziano affranca e a cui elargisce una somma di denaro. In realtà Marco Polo morirà quasi un anno più tardi e anche in questo periodo molte persone gli chiedono di ritrattare le cose illustrate nel suo milione. Non ho scritto nemmeno la metà delle cose che ho visto, è la risposta. No one doubts the authenticity of Marco Polo's will. Even today, however, some still doubt the truth of Marco Polo's stories. In 1995, Francis Wood, curator of Chinese collections at the British Library, published a book entitled Did Marco Polo Go to China? According to Wood, his memoir was a plagiarization of other travelers' tales. This controversial theory began a robust debate among historians. One questionable point is Marco Polo's claim to have taken part in the Battle of Xiangyang and to have helped the Mongols build trebuchets. The Mongols did use trebuchets to defeat the Southern Song army, but the battle ended in February 1273. The Polos didn't reach China until several months later. Marco Polo Marco Polo 
The travels of Marco Polo has its inaccuracies, but its descriptions of the Lugo Bridge and many other places are correct. Yet there is still debate in the West as to whether Marco Polo visited China at all. Oggi è abbastanza noto che eh, le descrizioni della vita in Cina effettuate da Marco Polo si riferiscano maggiormente a condizioni materiali ed economiche, più che a fenomeni legati alla politica, al sociale o alla cultura. Questo può essere eh, spiegato con la sua mancata completa integrazione, così come dell'imperatore di origine mongola, con la vita culturale della società eh, cinese, oppure che non fu testimone diretto di molti degli avvenimenti descritti, ma che riportò il racconto racconto di altri. Dobbiamo anche considerare che l'opera originale di Rustichello da Pisa non esiste più. Eh, gli esemplari del milione eh, più antichi sono copie manoscritte, come questa, scritta in latino e conservata alla Biblioteca Nazionale Marciana eh, di Venezia. E un copista può aver commesso errori, oppure può aver deciso di inserire variazioni o propri commenti al testo. At the end of the 14th century, a hundred years after Marco Polo's return to Venice, cartographers began using his memoir as a reference. In their Catalan atlas, commissioned by the King of Aragon as a gift for the King of France, Abraham Crescis and his son Yehuda referenced places Marco Polo had mentioned. Meanwhile, the aftermath of the Crusades disrupted the Silk Road linking Asia and Europe. Beh, intanto in quel periodo comincia ad aumentare la curiosità della Cina e insieme siamo uh, più o meno nell'epoca anche delle grandi scoperte geografiche. Il Cinquecento è caratterizzato da un grande interesse per i mondi lontani. La fine del Quattrocento e il Cinquecento sono un momento veramente di grande esplosione dell'interesse verso i mondi sconosciuti. Quindi tutti i libri che avessero a che vedere con la descrizione di mondi diversi sono libri che eh, cominciano ad attrarre con un eh, atteggiamento nuovo, più diciamo così scientifico eh, gli studiosi, non sono più semplicemente dei libri appunto dei racconti di mirabilia ma sono anche la descrizione di terre lontane. In order to extend their trade, Europeans started exploring maritime trade routes. One person who held no doubts about the truth of Marco Polo's tales was Christopher Columbus. When he set sail from Spain, he took two books with him, the Bible and the travels of Marco Polo. Columbus made handwritten notes in the margin of his copy of the book, which can be seen in the Seville Public Library in Spain. When he reached the Americas, hoping to find the treasures mentioned by Marco Polo, he insisted that he had set foot in China. Today, people travel from Europe to China every day. Yet Venice never erected a statue to Marco Polo. Always hesitant to glorify individuals, the city felt that it owed its commercial success to the efforts of all its citizens. But Marco Polo is still very special to Venice. Its airport is named Venice Marco Polo Airport. Venezia di aver dato i Natali a Marco Polo, eh, che abbia intitolato il suo aeroporto è ancora più significativo. L'aeroporto è il luogo per definizione da cui si parte. Si parte per dove? Si parte per eh, l'incognito. Eh, ogni volta che si parte, eh, anche se sappiamo dove andiamo, in realtà eh, non lo sappiamo fino in fondo e comunque speriamo che ci sia sempre una sorpresa. Ecco, la grande sorpresa eh, o una cosa del genere che ha colpito anche Marco Polo quando è arrivato in questo grande paese. One of the earliest portraits of Marco Polo is this engraving. It was done after a painting, now lost, by a 16th century artist who never set eyes on the famous traveller. 
Oggi di Marco Polo non rimane nessuna immagine attendibile. Il suo volto, così come lo conosciamo attraverso alcune stampe realizzate secoli dopo la sua morte, è una ricostruzione ipotetica eh, che non ci permette di eh, conoscere con certezza le vere fattezze del veneziano. Analogamente a quanto avvenuto con la sua immagine, oggi di Marco Polo a Venezia si è perduta anche la tomba. Secondo i voleri espressi nel suo testamento, si è sempre pensato eh, che fosse stato sepolto in questa chiesa, la chiesa di San Lorenzo e la sua sepoltura è stata a lungo cercata qui e nelle immediate vicinanze, ma non è mai stata trovata e dobbiamo ritenere che sia perduta per sempre. So to this day we don't know what Marco Polo looked like or where he was buried. Only his book is left. There are still those who doubt whether Marco Polo ever set foot in China. However, most scholars believe that it's not very meaningful to get entangled in that question. What is important is that in the era of Marco Polo, the dynasty established by the Mongols had a profound impact on China and even the world by opening the door of modernity. Marco Polo's travels was written 700 years ago. But his spirit still inspires people to explore new things. More and more people are working to promote exchanges and cooperation between East and West to create a more harmonious world. Marco Polo was not only an agent of cultural exchange and friendship between China and Italy, he belongs to the whole world and all of humanity.